Susan, is, am I showing my screen, sharing my screen now effectively? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the Urban Forestry Commission this evening for our first educational presentation of 2022. My name is Jan Pon Quaylen, and I'm the chair of the City of Springfield's Urban Forestry Commission. The commission is composed of seven of 10 commissioners, seven volunteer commissioners are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city council. We seven are a diverse lot. Randy Belleville owns and operates the new city greenhouse. Ernestine Lawrence is a retired administrator of district 186. Susan Allen is our go-getter, always volunteering to do whatever needs done. Dr. Amy McEwen gives us a connection to UIS. Um, Erskine Rute shares his knowledge of food tree growing from his orchard in his backyard. Scott Marlowe has a master's degree in biology in the, and is the environmental policy manager at IDOT. I'm retired from being an attorney at the Illinois Commerce Commission, and I'm very happy to be now advocating for trees. The UFC's mission is to advise and consult the arborist about forestry ordinances regulations, policies, and allocation and expenditure of funds, and to provide educational programs about trees and the urban forest. The UFC does not have a budget and has no direct authority. It plays a collaborative role with Jeff Frame, the city arborist, and um, public works. The urban forest is the collective of all the trees within Springfield. Think about flying over the city and what you would see. You would see a mixture of gray and green, the gray and green city infrastructure. The gray infrastructure is what we humans use to get around and get our business done. The city has been steadily investing in gray infrastructure for nearly 200 years. Millions of dollars are invested in streets and sidewalks every year. Trees make up the green infrastructure and they require investment too. Each mature tree represents a lifetime extending over multiple human generations. We need trees and to have and maintain them also requires annual investment. Why do we need trees? I have a whole list of reasons. The most obvious example is the effect of shade in the summer. Trees cool things off and not just a little bit. Surfaces in urban areas generate and trap heat. Trees and vegetation lower surface and air temperatures by providing shade and by converting water from liquid to vapor. Shaded surfaces, for example, may be 20 to 45 degrees cooler than the peak temperatures of unshaded materials. Trees also soak up stormwater, add beauty and tranquility, and contribute to our mental and physical well being. And very importantly, the urban forest provides habitat for native species, the other life forms in the city. And the bigger the tree, the bigger the benefit. The UFC um, has established four goals. Expand the green canopy, emphasize native trees and diversity, establish programs to encourage tree planting and maintenance, and establish long-term planning. One of the things that Springfield has been doing for the last few years is having tree giveaways. This year, the UFC will be giving away bare root seedlings at the city's Earth Day celebration on April 23rd at the Henson Robinson Zoo, at UFC's Arbor Day celebration on April 29 at the Boys and Girls Club, at the Sister City's International Nature celebration at UAS on April 30th, and at the Girl Scout Day at the Capitol on May 6th. Most of the seedlings will be oaks and other large trees because the bigger the tree, the more benefits it will provide. We are also busy planting trees. Last year when David Sands Japanese maples closed, Gail Myers offered the city hundreds of trees to celebrate the sister city relationship between Springfield, Illinois and Ashikaga, Japan. The trees are mostly Japanese maples, but include ginkgos, conifers, beech, 
tupelo, hardy maples, and other miscellaneous trees. The UFC has taken on planting these trees, relying on the energy and generosity of volunteers. Volunteers hauled a thousand trees and several pieces of statuary from David Sands to be stored at the new city greenhouse. Randy has the trees in storage to be planted in the city over the next three months. On December 4 of last year, about 18 volunteers planted arrangements of Japanese maples of various sizes on the northwest and southwest corners of Clear Lake and Dirksen. And on the south 5th and 6th streets south of the railroad tracks. We have many, many more trees to plant and are planning volunteer planting days on Sundays, April 24 and May 1, and there will be others as well. One of the UFC's accomplishments is the beginning of an inventory of the city's trees. Susan Allen successfully worked with Jeff to apply for a $20,000 grant for a tree inventory. The grant covered the tree inventory that was just completed in the Northeast of Springfield. We've gotten a lot of questions about why the city should go to the expense of a tree inventory. A tree inventory will tell us the size, the makeup and the health of the forest. That will allow us to analyze the diversity of species and age of the trees within the city and develop species planting guides. This statistical or overview from the inventory indicates that 3,580 trees were inventoried and the average tree condition was well below average. The tree inventory will give Springfield a quantitative analysis of Springfield's urban forest and a blueprint for maintaining it efficiently and effectively. For example, the inventory has identified eight trees that should be prioritized for removal and 503 trees that should be prioritized for pruning. This blueprint for managing the forest will help change the forest condition from below average to above average. I will put the details about the tree giveaways and the dates of the planting days in the chat box. If anyone is interested in volunteering for a tree planting or other activity, Please put your name and email or phone number in the chat box and I will add you to your list, to our list. And I will put my email in the chat box as well. I now have the pleasure <clears throat> to introduce the moderator of tonight's program, Ward 6 Alderwoman Erin Conley. As a, member of, as a member of city council, Erin advocates for the Urban Forestry Commission and supports adding more native trees to Springfield's neighborhoods. Erin brings over 20 years of professional government experience to ensure that core city services are provided to Ward 8 residents and to the city as a whole. Erin's professional government experience covers a range of environmental and regulatory fields. As the rules coordinator for the Illinois Pollution Control Board, Erin worked on regulations dealing with all aspects of environmental topics, including water, land, waste, and air quality. At the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, Erin assisted small businesses by providing the supports and tools needed to navigate complicated state and federal environmental requirements. In that position, Erin also served on numerous national committees advocating for small businesses throughout the state. Erin has also worked as the rules coordinator for the Illinois Department of Public Health, dealing with regulations ranging from long-term care facilities to the Illinois Plumbing Code. Currently, Erin is a project manager for IDPH's Center for Minority Health Services, where she manages the center's federally funded COVID response programs. Erin holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in plant biology. Uh, join me in welcoming Aaron, to be our moderator. Aaron. Good evening, and thank you very much, Jan, for that introduction. Um, I'm sure our participants were really glad to hear what the Urban Forestry Commission has been up to. Um, we have a great audience here tonight, and we all share an interest and love for trees and the environment. Um, we know that research has shown that trees and green areas contribute to our physical and mental health. So we are fortunate tonight to have two experts on trees and ecology, 
Dr. Amy McEwen and Dr. Lucia Vesquez. I'm going to introduce both speakers and then ask each of them to speak for about 15 minutes, after which we'll open it up to your questions, which you can enter in the chat room um, and indicate who you'd like an answer from. If you'd prefer, um, just raise your hand under the, um, the hand, those options, and, and we can call on you that way too. I am going to ask that everyone please stay muted during the presentation, just so we don't have any of the well-known uh, static and over noise of a, a Zoom meeting. Thank you. Um, first of all, we have Dr. Amy McEwen tonight. Dr. Amy McEwen has a PhD in terrestrial ecology from the University of Michigan from 2002. She also holds a master's degree in wildlife ecology from the University of Michigan and a Bachelor of Arts in Biochemistry from UC Berkeley. She is currently associate professor and chair of the biology department at the University of Illinois Springfield, where she teaches courses in ecology and conservation biology. Her research and pedagogy have been published in the journals Ecology, Restoration Ecology, Plant Ecology, and American Biology Teacher. She and her students have been studying the tall grass prairie restorations at the Nature Conservancy's Mquan Preserve near Havana, Illinois, since 2008. She is also interested in the challenges global environmental changes pose for conservation and approaches that, that foster plant conservation outside of nature reserves, for example, wild gardening. Dr. McEwen also serves as one of the members of our Urban Forest Commission. Dr. Lucia Vasquez earned her PhD in plant biology with a minor in molecular biology from Cornell University. She also holds a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from the National University of Mexico. Currently, she is a professor in the biology department at the University of Illinois Springfield, where she also holds a position as the vice chancellor for research and innovation. Dr. Vasquez's research has been published in the journals Madrono, Sida, Britonia, Frontiers in Plant Science, and Computational Biology and Chemistry. Her research focuses on oak diversity, genetic variation of oak populations, gene evolution in oak species, and conservation of oak ecosystems. So tonight we're gonna to begin with Dr. McEwen, who will speak about the advantages of native plants, and then move on to Dr. Vasquez, who will share some of her research on oak trees with us. We'll hold questions until the end of the program. Um, please again, enter them in the chat box when you think of them, or if you have a question that comes up from someone else's question, raise your hand and we will be sure to call on you. Thank you very much, and I pass this over to you, Dr. McEwen. Thank you, Alderwoman Conley. And thank you everyone for coming today. I always love to talk about trees and plants. So um, I'm excited and thank you again for being here. So I titled my talk, Seeds of Hope, uh, in part because I think that sometimes it can be hard to find hope in hard times. And these are definitely hard times. We've just gotten through a pandemic, right? We have wars going on globally. We have global climate change and it can all seem very daunting. And so one thing that gives me hope is when I get the chance to garden or to plant trees with Jan and Susan and others and Randy. Um, and I'm gonna talk today about the power of planting trees and particularly the power that we have in, um, in using native plants. So not just trees, but also um, forbs and grasses that are native to Illinois. So I've really enjoyed serving on the Urban Forestry Commission. It's one of my, I do a lot of service and it's one of my favorite um, activities uh, uh, in part because uh, it, it really is a group of uh, like-minded and very action-oriented individuals, and, and it's really inspiring to me to, um, to be able to, to work with them. And one thing I really enjoy about that group is that, um, you know, even though our primary goal is, of course, uh, increasing the trees in, in Springfield and this kind of urban forestry goal, 
I really do hear conversations on the commission about this broader goal of making Springfield, um, you know, more environmentally friendly, expanding the green spaces, and in doing so, um, supporting other um, parts of biodiversity, right? So, you know, not just the trees, but the, uh, the butterflies and the birds and all of that. So, so I think we share in many ways this vision of having a city that's just um, a beautiful uh, as well as functional. And so you can see in this picture, uh, I'll get more into native and non-native in a bit, but you know, I'm like anyone else, when those daffodils bloom, I'm so happy. <laughs> every spring, right? Uh, but it, but one of the points of the talk is that interspersed with those kind of non-native plants that we put in the landscape, it's also important that we have things like this oak tree I've put here in the back, and Dr. Vasquez will talk about that, the importance of oaks later, and then also plants like this aster that's shown here, uh, and I purposefully put the photo in there with the monarch butterfly on it because Asters are known to be a good, very good nectar source. So when the monarchs are coming back um, south and they need a little um, sugar, sugary drink, the, the asters and the blazing stars and a number of our forbs are very good for that. So one reason I love to give talks in public is I can put in little quotes and things like that that I <laughs> uh, and talk about how seeds make me feel hopeful and things that I may not um, be able to put into more of a research oriented talk. Uh, and it is true that for me, I would I would almost say that I feel like seeds are miraculous. It's still incredible to me. It's even more incredible once you know the biology, in my opinion, of how you can take this little seed, in this case, this little acorn and put it in the ground and it can literally pull you know, material from the air and from the soil and over time grow into this magnificent, um, beautiful tree. So I put this quote here. This actually, I've known this quote for a while. This quote was at the, the start of my dissertation as well, because I worked on seeds for my dissertation. And I love it in just that it talks about the faith that we have in a seed, right? So Thoreau says, if you have a seed there, uh, I am prepared to expect wonders. So they really are very powerful. And I would argue that if we're planting seeds, we should be planting seeds of our native plants from Illinois. And I'll talk a little bit about why um, I say that in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, first of all, just to go with our kind of textbook definitions, what's a native um, plant or a native species versus a non-native species. Well, one way we can think about that is just what would have occurred historically um, in this region of North America. So a native species, as it says here, uh, occurs within its natural range. Um, and then would it would have occurred here um, naturally without humans having brought it to um, to a location, uh, as opposed to our non native species that are species that are outside of their natural range and, uh, and usually are either introduced sometimes purposefully and or other times um, by accident. And sometimes they do require human care if we think about our nursery plants and things like that. So when I, when I talk about this with my students, I'm like, okay, we're getting in our time machine, right? So it's like, so that's how I like to think about native and non-natives. Like, is something a native plant? Well, let's get in our time machine, right? And go back 500 years ago and start to, of course, the first thing we're gonna do when we get out of our time machine is identify plants, right? And so we're gonna start to identify plants and we'll see big blue stem and we'll see, um, uh, you know, Indian grass and we'll see our milkweeds and our oak oak trees and our maple trees, but there's lots of things that we see now in our landscapes that we wouldn't see if we were back, at, you know, if we took this time machine 500 years ago, we wouldn't have roses and we wouldn't have our dandelions or our tulips, right, or our, if we think about our bush honeysuckle, some of our invasive species and things like that. So that's a way that I like to think about what um, native um, plant species are as opposed to um, non-native species. 
And so if we went back in our time machine and we walked into a forest, uh, we might see, for example, um, the sugar maple trees. Uh, and so this is the current range of sugar maple trees, but sugar maples have been in North America for you know, thousands and thousands of years. And in fact, they've shifted their distribution as the glaciers came down and all of that. So that very long, deep, rich history. And it turns out that that's important as to why we have to, uh, or it's good to plant native of plants. I'll get back to that in a second. So a sugar maple would be an example of a native species. Um, and an example of a non-native species would be the Norway maple. And these are easy to, you know, we have both of these in our city, right? I actually have a Norway maple in my front yard, right? And they look very similar. So you might not know if you just went to your nursery, right? Um, that, uh, that they have this difference in terms of their ability to support uh, our local biodiversity. So why is that? Why, uh, why does it matter if something has that long history in a given region or not? And the answer is evolution. So if you guys don't recognize this guy, um, this is good old Charles Darwin, right? His, his statue at the museum. Uh, and it turns out what our native plants, why it's so important is they have that long evolutionary history uh, with the insects, that are native to North America with the birds that are native to North America. And so because of that, those are the plants that our butterflies and moths eat, right? And those moths and butterflies are the insects that the birds eat, et cetera. And we could really dig down if we wanted to. And this is uh, Dr. Vasquez's uh, area of expertise. So you could ask her lots of questions because she actually did oak, oak phylogenetics for her dissertation. Um, so so this, this complex uh, dynamic between, in this case, when we think about native plants and our native insects, um, you know, plants kind of develop defenses and then the native insects um, are able to, you know, kind of counter adapt and be able to eat those plants still. And so because of that, our native herbivores, they're adapted to eat these local plants. So what that means is that if we put our milkweeds and our asters and our blazing stars and these types of things out into our gardens or our greenways, they'll support these insects and then these insects will serve as a food source for our birds. And so you're basically supporting the whole food chain um, for our local ecosystem. So this just shows you that in pictures. Right, this is of course our sugar maple, right? It looks like normal maple, but this is our sugar maple. And so our little caterpillars can eat it. And then the chickadees can eat the caterpillars. So basically just to summarize, you know what I've been saying, the native plants, right? Support the native insects, which then feed the native birds. And of course, one of the well-known examples of this is why we're putting milkweed back into our landscapes, right? So we know the monarch caterpillar has this amazing adaptation where it can take the toxins from the milkweed plant and sequester them, and that actually helps protect it from predators. So the milkweed feeds the, uh, feeds the caterpillar, and then of course the adult butterflies also need these nectar sources um, as energy sources of while they're migrating. And so those would just be two examples of native plants, our milkweeds and our asters. And we, you know, we know our monarchs so well, we love them, we love the migration and everything, but there's so many, I mean, the thing I love is there's so many different butterflies and, and moths and all of that. So, you know, if you put a spice bush, say you've got a wet little spot, right? A spice bush is a great bush to put in a wet spot. Uh, and lo and behold, that the spice bush swallowtail is our butterfly, um, our local butterfly that can eat either the spice bush or one of our native trees, the sassafras tree. So this makes sense kind of conceptually, uh, but more and more people have also been collecting data um, to demonstrate uh, that the amount of native plants you have in the landscape actually translates into health of um, some of our native bird populations. So this is one paper 
just looking at this, the x-axis here is the percentage of the landscape that is in non-native plants. And this is these little chickadees and how well they're able to fledge their young. And so you can see they're fledging, you know, almost three young if you have a landscape that's all native plants, almost 100% native plants. But if you go on the other extreme of, you know, all non-native plants, then they just don't have the insects to eat. And so because of that, they're not able to produce a lot of young. And I really like chickadees. Um, and so why is that? Why do you not get as many chickadees growing in, you know, a landscape that has non-native plants? Well, a lot of that is, again, they just don't have um, their food source. So we think of birds eating seeds, but really a lot of our birds are insectivorous, right? So they need those caterpillars um, and, you know, beetle larvae, all those little insects that grow uh, in the plants. So this is another study. Uh, I love this y-axis, lepidoptera probability, and that just means like how likely are you to see a butterfly or a moth, right? So that's our y-axis, and then um, and then down here we have different genuses um, of trees, and you can see they compared on here native um, to non-native. So within a given genus of trees, so these are our maples, right? We were just talking about um, sugar maple versus Norway maple. And so if we were comparing for our maples, we would see, well, we see a lot more of these butterflies if we have a native maple, right? Than if we have the non-native maple. And the other thing I like in this graph is you can also see that there is differences between these different genuses of trees too, right? So our beaches aren't don't as support as many um, moths and butterflies as our oaks. Uh, I think someone commented on our tree list that we had a lot of oaks and I was kind of looking like, mm, that could have been me on the Urban Forestry Commission, right? <laughs> Pushing the oaks in part because of data like this that suggests that the oaks are really good for supporting our local insect diversity. Okay, so bear with me with this table. It's actually really exciting. Okay, so this is looking at birds, right? And, and they compared landscapes that had native plants um, to landscapes, you know, conventional landscapes that had more non-native plants. And so don't worry, I'm gonna talk you through this. So if you, if you, you can keep me honest if you understand the p-values, but if you don't, that's okay too. So what they're looking at here is First off, abundance. So how many birds you see in a native, you know, uh, yards that have native plants versus conventional yards that have more non-native plants. So you see significantly more birds if you have native um, gardens. You see higher richness. And richness is just the number of species, right? So say in a native um, um, plot, all well, they're seeing, you know, 19 species on average, whereas in the other, they're only seeing like 11 different types of birds. Um, there's more amount of bird, right? So biomass. So if you're going to weigh all the birds, um, you're going to have more if in the native landscape, higher diversity. And then if you go down, these BCCs are birds of conservation concern. So the ones we're most worried about in terms of their population number, those are also significantly higher in landscapes that have uh, that are planted in the in native plants. And then you can see why they actually compared in this study the insectivorous birds with the omnivores, right? And it's really because those native plants support the insects. So oh, I'm over here showing you a p-value. Anyway. <laughs> it's because they're so much more abundant, um, the, the insectivorous birds in those native landscapes. Okay. So here is to kind of sum it up in a picture, right? Your yard is this kind of universe. We have all these little animals um, in our yards and that, and that can help support the whole food chain. Okay, so if you want to know more, where do you get native plants? Where do you get native seeds? Um, locally, probably the best sales are the Illinois Native Plant Society sale that should be taking place pretty soon here. Uh, and then also Lincoln Memorial Garden has a native plant sale. I think that's taking place right now. Some other really great organizations, um, if you're interested in invertebrate conservation are the Xerces Society. They're really focused on trying to make sure that 
um, you know, our butterflies um, and, and those types of animals are conserved. Of course, no, nearby, we also have our Missouri Botanical Garden. If you wanted to order seeds, um, I usually use Prairie Moon Nursery, but more and more, there's lots of native plant nurseries that you can get um, seeds from. And I'm, help it, I'm happy to share this PowerPoint. So if you wanna pop me an email, I will, will um, you know, share this so uh, you can have these sources. So I'll just end with a quote and then an introduction. So this is um, one of the uh, researchers who's very well known with kind of promoting native landscaping uh, is, is Doug Ptolemy. And, and he talks about how We've typically used plants as decorations in the past. So thinking of having these beautiful cities, which of course is a lovely thing to have, but we'd also like to have our plants be functional, right? In terms of supporting these other animals that we want to make sure that we can um, have still in our cities. Okay, I have to say I didn't take these pictures. I got it. If you guys don't know about Pixabay, it is this amazing website where people just take amazing photos and put them up into the public domain. So I always like to say thank you to all of the people who put their photos in the um, in the public domain, and then also, of course, everyone who keeps gardening and planting seeds. And I think I now have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, um, Dr. Vasquez, um, who is, as I've already said, well, uh, I guess um, we had an introduction in terms of her professional um, background and she's a professor in the biology department among a lot of other things. So I'm excited to hear what she has to say about oaks. I think you might, you're muted, I think, Lucia. I'm having some issues share, uh, with sharing my screen. Let me see. Hmm. Can you see if I'm okay sharing the screen? Not yet. Okay. Are you no, seeing the option on there to share screen or not? Yes. Uh, that doesn't let me share it. Uh, hmm. Let me just take a quick look here. Older woman, Conley, you walked me through it. Maybe you can help uh, Dr. Vasquez. I was just going to say, um, Xavier, we might need to make uh, Dr. Vasquez a co-host so she can share her screen. Yeah, I think that that will work. Yeah. I believe that Jan currently has the hosting privileges. So if she goes, if she hovers over um, Dr. Vasquez, Yes. You click the three dots that yes. are on her picture. Oh, I see. There we go. That's it. Can you see it now? Yes. yes. Perfect. Yes. All right. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Alderman Conley and uh, my colleague, Amy McEwen. Um, I hope my, my talk is not too academic. Uh, I usually don't do too many uh, talks of this type, so I hope it's not too academic. So, uh, but anyway, thank you everyone for uh, the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share my research with all of you. So I will start by um, just kind of give you a general idea of my presentation. I'm going to focus on three main areas. I'm going to I'm going to start by giving an introduction and talking about the general characteristics of oak trees, the importance of oak trees. And then for the second half of my talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about my research. 
and probably here I'm going to be preaching to the choir. Probably you already know this information. So as you know, oaks are very diverse. Uh, currently, there is an estimation of about about 430 species. Uh, in terms of distribution, they can be found in uh, temperate areas in the northern hemisphere and in temperate areas, subtropical areas, and even slightly tropical areas. As you can see in the map, the highest diversity of oak species are found in Southeast Asia and in, in the Americas. And just talking about the Americas, uh, here on this slide, we can see the distribution of oaks that ranges from Southern Canada all the way to Colombia and with the highest diversity found in Mexico. And for a couple of reasons, uh, I have been focusing on oaks from Mexico. One of them, but I'm originally from Mexico and the other one, which is I think the main one is that the highest diversity of oak species in the Americas is found in Mexico. So the examples I'm gonna present, most of them are gonna be from, from Mexican species. So I'll start first by sharing in the next few slides some general characteristics of oaks. Sometimes when we think about oak trees, we well, about oaks rather, we tend to think about trees and we perhaps in our mind have the idea of like a 30 feet tall tree. However, when we start looking at the variation, we find some very surprising species. For example, on the left-hand side, you can see Quercus frutex, which is a plant that, gr um, that grows at the ground level. So what you can see there is just, is not, those are not seedlings. Those are mature uh, uh, species, mature individuals. Um, and on the opposite hand, we have Quercus insignis, which you can see here, it gets to be up to about 200 feet tall. And similar to that variation in size, we have it in, uh, in acorns. Acorns, we have some, in some species, they're really tiny acorns, like probably about a third of an inch. And unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that kind of acorn. Uh, but, and then on the opposite side, we have some acorns for Quercus insignis, which are three to four inches long. So huge diversity there. Uh, in terms of habitat, we have, we tend to think about oaks as growing in forests. And that's, yeah, that's the case with most species, but we have also some, um, some species that grow in desert areas, very dry, spheric environments. And on the opposite side, we have uh, some species growing in cloud forests, very humid uh, forests. And associated with that, we have a range of elevations. We have here on the left-hand side, Quercus oleoides, which grows at the sea level. And then on the opposite side, we have Quercus rugosa, which grows uh, in, in, in a range of like about 4,000 meters above sea level. So um, I think uh, here again, I'm gonna be kind of preaching to the choir. I think you guys know what oaks are very important. Uh, we are always going to emphasize that oaks are keystone species. And for my students, I always say, well, what would happen? Just think about a, the concept of a keystone. And if we were to remove some of those oak species from the ecosystem, the whole ecosystem would collapse. And just to get a better understanding of the importance of oaks and why they're, um, they're keystone species, let me share with you in the next slide, some of the associations they have with wildlife. So as Dr. McEwen touched on this, uh, in one of her slides in terms of the, um, the butterflies that are supported by oaks, but there's actually a wide range of organisms that are supported by oaks and include insects, birds, mammals, and many times we don't think about it, but also other plants. The plants that grow on top of the branches, which are called epiphytes, there is a wide variety of species that, that also depend on, on oak trees. And here's just an example in terms of um, insect diversity. And you can see here on this slide, there is more than a thousand insect species they depend on oak trees. And this information here is based on a very small subset of species. So it's not accounting for the 430 species. It's 
uh, in this case, the, uh, it takes into account probably about eight species that supporting this over a thousand species of, um, of insects. Also, uh, oaks provide a variety of ecosystem services. We know that uh, uh, they are very good carbon sequesters and consequently they contribute to climate regulation. In addition to that, they are very important from the economic standpoint. And as you can see in these two graphs, there are, at the, in the top graph, you can see some of the uses uh, of the oak species. You can see medicinal uses, uh, some parts are edible, used for fodder, crafts, and also tannins, dye. Wood is not included there, but that's also another important part. And of the different structures in oaks, you can see which parts are used. In the bottom graph, you can see um, the uh, species where the bark is used, or the acorns, leaves, gold, saps, flowers. But like here is just a very interesting um, piece of information. Uh, there are some flowers in Mexico where, like the catkins, are collected by the local people, and they're mixed with eggs and just kind of cooked. Uh, just kind of, uh, kind of like, like a cover, uh, cover a batter with that covers all the catkins. So I, I thought that, that was kind of an interesting use. So um, something kind of here is like oaks are fascinating, as we know, and uh, something I'm glad that, that Dr. McHugh talked about hope because as I was preparing this presentation, I was starting to feel a little depressed, you know because when you start thinking about, on the one hand, the rich diversity of oak species, and on the other hand, thinking about the threats to oaks, uh, such as climate change and the estimations, like for example, that we could lose from two to 57% of the oak surface of some species, not to mention the extinction, but uh, just climate change by itself could have a huge impact on some of these species. And also another threat associated in part with climate change uh, it is also a pest, the increase, increase in pests and diseases. And of course, as we know, habitat destruction. And the most recent report uh, and that assesses uh, the risk of extinction, get this information, oops, sorry, information about, about one third of the oaks are threatened with extinction. That means one in three oaks are uh, threatened with extinction. That is a kind of like a shocking, um, shocking piece of information. And uh, uh, it gets a little discouraging. And so being a person passionate about oaks, I asked myself, okay, what can I do? I should be able to do something. And so that kind of like my research has been focusing on two main areas with the hope of contributing to saving these oaks. One of them is biodiversity assessment, and the second one is conservation. And I'll talk about this in more detail as I move along. So how can I contribute to biodiversity assessment? As you may recall earlier, I said, there are about 430 species of oaks, and this is an estimation. And why one is not certain about how many species are out there? We know that, uh, yeah, we can basically take a look at some of the external features of oaks to identify them, such as the leaves, the twigs, the uh, acorns, the bark. So we know we, we can do this in some species. However, we have some challenges in, in other cases. And one of those challenges is, is shown here. And, um, when I have show this slide, I would like to always ask, how many species do you think we have here? And some people will say, I don't know, maybe, maybe two, maybe one. And it turns out that in this case, we have, we have five species. So each of them are somewhat similar. So, and, but yeah, we can find some distinguishing features. Let me show you another example. How many species do you think are here? So some of them, I, some, in some presentations, people have said, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe three, maybe five. Well, in this case, we have only one species. And you can see that um, kind of, I, I hope that with these two types of um, 
slides, I can show you the complexity of identifying some oak species. And to the point that there have been some cases, like in this case, Corpus castania, where there have been like more than, uh, well, around 11 names associated with the different shapes of the, uh, the leaf variation that you find in this species. So the next question is, okay, so what, what can we do to kind of distinguish these different species? And uh, we have, I think particularly in Mexico, we have all kinds of pero species that look almost identical, but they are different species. We have, it is interesting how the diversification in Mexico is very different from the diversification in, in the U United States. So we have this first of species that look alike um, and a very uh, helpful tool has been looking at the plant hairs, which are a fancy name for them as trichomes. So if we examine the surface, uh, the undersurface, we can actually find these differences. Um, and in some cases, uh, well, these pictures were taken with an elect electron microscope. In other cases, you just need a regular microscope to tell the differences. So they have been very useful in uh, identifying some of these uh, difficult species. So here, just kind of side by side, we have these two species that look alike, Quercus crocipis, Quercus mexicana. And then just by looking at the underneath, the surface underneath the leaves, we can just tell them apart. So here the, the take home message is that trichomes have become a very useful tool for identifying species that look very similar. Uh, and in some cases, in addition of looking at those trichomes and looking at additional morphological features, it has been helpful for finding new species. So uh, the, this picture here on the left shows um, uh, species that I published about three years ago. It's a new species found in central Mexico. And a co-author and I are working on a second species, which is here. The picture is here, it's unpublished. We hope the, to have it ready by probably, hopefully the end of, of the year. So, and, and again, this kind of shows you when we talk about, we're not sure how many species are out, out there, is the other uh, kind of interesting thing is diversification. There is a lot of potential new species in areas of high diversification, such as China and, and Mexico. Now we have some cases where even though we use um, trichomes, morphology, we still are not able to determine what we have in front of us. For example, here, okay, do we have what species or we have three species? So in those cases, we have to use additional tools and something I have used in my research is DNA. DNA has helped us uh, answer a variety of questions and I'll go one by one. Well, with the exception of the last, the nuclear genes, I think I'll probably run out of time, but I'll talk about the, the other ones. Let me start with the identification of species boundaries. So you may be familiar with the idea of a barcode, right? So you go to the, to the grocery store, you scan it, and each barcode is associated to an item. So about a decade ago, a group of scientists came up with the idea, what about if we have something similar? Uh, at the DNA level? Could we have some kind of a unique marker that could be associated with a species? And this is what is called DNA barcoding. And here's kind of the general principle. So we would also, well, let us assume we have here a different species and a different species here in this case of spiders. Um, and each color, yeah, corresponds to a different species. So what we would do in this case is um, extract the DNA then we select a DNA, we make many copies of the DNA, and each the copies are represented here. For example, this orange uh, gene uh, corresponds to the orange spider. And then we do the sequencing, which is a way of kind of reading the DNA molecule. And so you end up with all these stretches of letters that correspond to the DNA sequences. And so if barcoding works, then what we will see here is that, for example, the, the green spider will have a unique molecule that is represented by green. Oops, 
uh, and, and same thing for the other species. So that's kind of the general principle of DNA barcoding. So my, my lab has been working on that and testing different genes. And so we have found this differentiation. And what you can see here, like uh, this, the way we read this is this horizontal line corresponds to a segment of a DNA molecule. And, and all of these different rows here correspond to different individuals of the same species. So what we want to find here is a unique uh, pattern of in the DNA that will be associated with the species. And that's why kind of the analogy with the barcoding. So in my lab, we have been testing so far about 15 different genes. We have seen differences, unique differences in uh, white oaks and red oaks. They have a unique molecular signature. And I have also collaborated with some uh, colleagues from China. And in that case, we were able to test six different genes. And when we combine the information of these six different genes, they allowed us to identify 35 oak species. So the take home message here is that the chloroplast and nuclear genes can be used to find these unique signatures that we can associate with species. And currently uh, I have a, work, a group of students testing uh, additional genes to see if they can serve as, as a DNA barcode. Now, let me move on to a different part of my research, which is uh, genetic diversity. And before I get delve into the details of my research, let me just have a very general reminder of genetic diversity. We know that genetic diversity is kind of like the basis for other types of diversity, such as species and ecosystem diversity. And when we talk about diversity, and again, pre here probably preaching to the choir, you already know this, that we want to have uh, ecosystems with high gen and, and species with high genetic diversity. Because if we have this type of diversity, it would allow those uh, species and those populations to adapt more easily, to survive if there are some kinds of, um, for example, climate change, if it can, becomes drier or wetter. So the species with higher genetic diversity have more flexibility to do that, and, and in general, they are more resilient. And low genetic diversity is, is the opposite. So uh, as we know around um, the world, there are many fragmented uh, ecosystems. And as a part of um, um, the thesis uh, research for one of my students, we uh, assess the genetic variation in Carpenter Park. I'm not sure some of you probably have been there. Uh, we studied there a couple of species, Quercus alba, Quercus mishoya, and the main purpose was to assess genetic diversity and by doing that, understanding uh, the effect of uh, forest fragmentation. Uh, what we found in that case was very interesting in terms of these two species. We found that, well, of course, the uh, Quercus alba was more abundant and we, sample across the whole forest, the whole, the whole area, we only found eight individuals of Quercus Vishoya. And uh, not surprising, we found that uh, Quercus Vishoya has a low genetic variation. And Quercus alba was uh, a little bit higher, but still on the low level of genetic variation, which is understandable, given that it's a fragmented forest. Something surprising though, was the number of gene variants. For a very small number, in this case, only eight individuals, individuals, we found three variants, whereas in the larger population of Quercus alba, we found, found five. So that was kind of very interesting. We um, don't know exactly why those numbers, we will don't know, we'll need to do probably additional studies, but the, the take home message here is something not surprising, there's already a document in the literature, is that a small isolated populations have low genetic variation, but finding this kind of results also prompted us to think about, again, genetic diversity. Could we increase the genetic diversity of that area by planting acres from other natural areas? What about if we introduce more Quercus alba from other areas? And here there is a whole controversy about that. Probably uh, Dr. McEwen teaches about this in her conservation class. There's a whole uh, discussion about people being in favor and against uh, of this kind of strategy for 
um, the potential consequences this might have. And, and if there is time, we can, we can talk about that. But for now, let me move on and talk about the last area of my research, which is the, how can we use the information included in DNA to predict population changes? So what we do in this case is that uh, we go into the field, we collect across the range, and in this case, this was work was done in collaboration with uh, some colleagues from China. So what you're seeing here is a map of China, and they are the ones, I think, go to China. They sample all the, um, a good number of um, uh, individuals across uh, the, the distribution range. Uh, then we did molecular work to determine uh, the variance of the gene, which is what you see here in, in different colors. And then we combine that information with climate data, geographic data, computer modeling, and we were able to predict the behavior of this population. So we have on the, in this map on the left-hand side, the current population uh, distribution. And then on the right-hand side, what would happen as the temperature in increases and other uh, factors associated with climate change um, vary over time. So, so the take home message of all this work is that we have the tools to be able to predict what could happen in different situations, particularly now in the face of climate change. We could use these tools to perhaps to develop conservation strategies. So I'm gonna kind of close here by just kind of telling you about my vision for future, for the future of Oaks. What I, um, I want to continue doing the same research I have been doing involving more students, but also something I really wanna do and actually your invitation to this presentation made me aware of my need to develop more collaborations outside the university. I'm very interested in promoting the importance of OAKS, kind of bringing this education to different levels, to participating in, in uh, implementation plans to decrease deforestation rates and have reforestation campaigns at a global level. And I will start by here in Springfield by participating on that. And I hope that uh, long term I can establish some partnership with your group. And my dream will be to make Springfield known as a uh, very well known for the urban forest. So I want to kind of end up by thanking here my two nephews who were great helping. They were so cute helping when, when I was collecting in Mexico. They really knew, learned how to press the plants, and they, they were they loved doing that. So thank you very much. And I'll, I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank, thank you both. Um, those are wonderful presentations. Um, Dr. Vasquez, I remember my days of, of pressing plant leaves too. So I'm, any helper is good help. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, so this is, a, this is a wonderful taste of, of the research and, and teaching that, that's going on here at, at the U of I um, campus in Springfield. Um, Thank you for that. For the sake of time, we're going to move on to questions. I do believe we have one question from Susan Allen. Um, if you can see in the, in the uh, chat box, uh, Dr. Vasquez, at the UFC, we like to plant trees. Can you advise us about types of oaks to plant in Springfield? Uh, well, I, I think that um, I don't think I can do much advice in terms of type of oaks, other than just going to go with going with uh, Dr. McEwen was saying, you know, some of the native oak species. Uh, so I think that that's what I will go. Um, I think uh, uh, Quercus rubra, Quercus alba, I think there are a set of a list of species that are native to the area. Uh, it's kind of interesting to me uh, to see there is Quercus acutissima, I don't remember what's the common name, which is that introduced oak from China, from Asia. And that, that's again, something that is uh, there's documentation about, again, the negative effects of including uh, a non-native tree in the landscape. So, but yeah, and, and also I remember, what was, I uh, don't remember his name, somebody who works in the forest, that, uh, in the forest commission, I think that also, so I think that there might be somebody more experienced than me to give that recommendation. Thank you, though. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions right now? I don't, uh, let's see here. Um, a question from Pamela. If so, how does this affect genetic diversity in a species? 
I think uh, Dr. Vasquez, that's probably. Uh, yeah, well, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, as we know, hi, uh, oaks hybridize very, very easily. How it affects the genetic diversity, um, I think it depends on the species. Sometimes they're involved. Some species, I mean, you tend to see higher, um, higher genetic diversity. Uh, and in other cases, depending on the incompatibility, it seems like some of the, the species acquire, uh, uh, I don't know, you said like bad traits. Um, but overall, I mean, it's just kind of, yeah, hybridization is very common as, as we know in, in, the, in oaks. Thank you. And then Susan, um, you mentioned oak diseases and pests. How much of a problem are those to the oak trees in Springfield? Uh, that's an excellent question, but I'm not sure. Uh, here's to everyone. Yeah, probably people who have worked more on, on the pests and uh, uh, oak disease. Hopefully, I mean, lo luckily, I mean, it seems like uh, California is the one that is really bad and in terms of some of these pests, but I'm not aware of a very, very bad problem here in Springfield, but some of you may know Certainly, I mean, certainly we've seen what the, what we've, what's gone on with our ash trees in terms of mm -hmm. in, invasive pests. So uh, it's good to know maybe we don't have such a big problem with that here. <laughs> um, and, then, and then another question, is it okay to plant or good to mix sugar maples with oaks in a parkway or in a common space? can take that one I would say yes <laughs> so I mean one of our goals for the urban forestry commission is to get a diversity of different genuses different species in part because I mean the emerald ash borer is a mm -hmm. kind of a perfect although sad example mm -hmm. of you know if you have so much planting of just one type of tree then unfortunately that mm -hmm. makes you really vulnerable if a pest comes through that that can destroy that tree. So the mm -hmm. benefit of having, you know, some maples and some oaks and some, you know, elms or whatever is that then that kind of protects you if you have, um, you know, some disease that comes through that that one of those groups is susceptible for. I mean, they do have different characteristics that they need. Mm -hmm. Like I think, you know, oaks tend to like it. Well, I don't know, there's so many different species of oaks, but higher light in general and the maples need, you know, tend to like a little bit more shade, mm -hmm. but there's a lot mm -hmm. of variation between each of those. So you could you could definitely find them. They, they hang out together in the forest, so they'll be happy to hang out in your parkway together. So, and, and maybe I, I, I'd like to ask, um, moving from the positive of what's good together. Can you name, maybe just give us some idea of some species that would be good to avoid? I know there was an article in the Illinois Times and we were talking before this started about the, the Bradford pears. Mm. Uh, Dr. McEwen, maybe you, if you wanna. Yeah, I would say, you know, I would, a lot of those non-native um, species, um, also, for a lot of them, if they say something like aggressive, <laughs> so even with your native species, you need to be mm -hmm. a little bit careful, you know, like, you know, people like to plant silver maples, but they are kind of, you know, floodplain species. And so, you know, they're, they're good in some places and not others. I mean, you can always check I mean, the Missouri Botanical Garden is great for mm -hmm. this in terms of both giving you, is it native status? What it might be good for? Is it good for a garden uh, or not? So, um, I mean, luckily now with the with the web, we had, you know, right there at our fingertips, we can just mm -hmm. double check before we um, pick anything up. And I know the, the Urban Forestry Commission is working with the city's um, arborist to really mm -hmm. keep that tracked and, and followed along. Um, I think I even kind of gave them a little hard time about Bradford bears. <laughs> um, and then Susan, good question. What native species are good to plant under and around trees? What kind of mixes of planting should we be looking for? Yeah, for that, um, I would go with the, you know, like your spring ephemerals, I think are really nice because, you know, you can almost think of what you would have uh, in a forest, right, with mm -hmm. that level of shades. 
Um, so, you know, things like your trillium or your blood root mm -hmm. and, um, and, and again, you can get those, I know Lincoln Memorial Garden native plant, um, sale does a lot of, uh, um, plants like that. Oh, I love my, oh, what's the one with the yellow? Oh, the wood poppy is, is one I really like, or the wild geranium, or I could go on and on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but there's, and some will, will, you know, populate more than others, right? So if you kind of want one that, you know, put out there and it'll kind of spread around, like the, the wild geranium is pretty good for that and has this nice kind of ground cover. Great, thank you. And then, um, Susan, I think actually this next, this next question might be more for, for you or for Jan. Um, we have from Carrie Smith um, asking about collaboration on the tree giveaway and getting more of a focus on the Enos Park neighborhood um, garden in the Enos Park area. So maybe, I don't know, Jan or Susan, if you'd wanna kind of respond to that. I mean, I know you have dates and locations set up. We're happy to collaborate. Up. We like to collaborate. If somebody wants to, you know, we're gonna give those trees away till we don't have any. So if anybody has an idea of where would be a good place to give trees away, we have, uh, I hate to say it, but I think we have about a thousand trees this year to give away. They are small, they're bare root seedlings, but the price is right. And we're happy to collaborate. So just contact Susan or me or anyone at the Urban, Amy, anyone at the Urban Forestry Commission and we will work with you and try to figure out how we can swing it. Wonderful. And we have um, two events that the trees are going to be distributed at. It's Arbor Day on the 29th, April 29th at the Boys and Girls Club, and then Earth Awareness Fair. And I believe that's April 23rd, isn't it, Jan, at the zoo? Yes, I put those dates on in the chat box for people. Otherwise, you can go to the City of Springfield website under Public Works, and the Urban Forestry Commission has a page there, and the dates will be listed there as well. And then Polly Poskins has brought up a good question. Is there a not-so-large flowering native tree that will thrive in central Illinois? Obviously, we've, we've talked about this before with planting under power lines, and then we get those horrible, you know, 